Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for yet another one of the Sprint Seminar Series uh, presentations hosted by the Stavros Niamos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at San Juan Fraser University. My name is Dimitris Karlis, I'm the director of the uh, Stavros Niamos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'll be responsible for uh, moderating today's talk, or I'll probably just try to stand aside and let the conversation happen. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event is taking place at the uh, SFU on Burnaby campus, on the Burnab on Burnaby mountain, on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Slaytooth, Musqueam, and Cougatlam peoples. I'm very pleased to present today's uh, speaker, Dr. Monica Cassis. Dr. Cassis is Associate Professor in the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. She specializes in Byzantine and Syriac archaeology, and currently directs the Byzantine excavations at Chadir Hayuk, uh, which has uh, had uh, recent support from the uh, Shirk Insight uh, grant and has, uh, and uh, Marika has worked on the site since 2004. That's quite a commitment. Uh, her publication is engaged with questions of transition, transformation, climate, conquest, and trade in uh, Anatolia. And uh, current projects include a book on uh, Byzantine archaeology under contract with Art Humanities Press, as well as two forthcoming articles on gender theory and Byzantine archaeology. Uh, without uh, further ado, I'll pass the podium to Marika. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here on a snowy day in, in I was going to say in Calgary. It's also a snowy day in Calgary. You're welcome. I brought it with me. Um, but I really appreciate everyone being here. Um, so I'm going to uh, start today with my own I'm going to make the computer go. <laughs> Hang on. Is there? Oh, there it is. It's just slow. It's waiting for me. OK, uh, I'm going to just start with our own land acknowledgement from the University of Calgary. So I'm coming to you today um, and from the University of Calgary. And I'd like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7 located in the heart of Southern Alberta, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised of the Siksika, the Pekainai and the Kainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nations and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki Bearspaw and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta districts five and six. Um, and I wanted to start with the acknowledgement because uh, in, a, in a twist of things, I'm actually going to talk a little bit um, about a couple of indigenous communities um, as I start to lead into talking about the micro history of, um, <clears throat> of Chatterhoek in central Anatolia. So I wanna start by talking about identity and the politics of identity and why micro history matters. Uh, so this is a quote I always start with, with my students when I teach the ancient Near East um, because they always come in and they, wanna, they want to know all about all the facts. They want to know how things happen. They want an exact timeline. And I spend a lot of time going, eh. Um, so history is a story. The present tells itself about the past and its meaning lies in the interaction of the two. Um, the image has no connection to it, except that I really like it. And sometimes when I'm in the depth of trying to figure out what I'm talking about, um, I feel a bit like I'm being eaten by, uh, by that monster. Um, <clears throat> so, what I want to start with today is actually talking a little bit about why micro histories matter in the modern period and how our narratives change depending on how we learn and teach and think about things. And so I, I actually want to start with uh, a couple of towns in Alberta to sort of think this through. Uh, and I promise there's a method to my madness. Um, so what you have up here is a roadmap of Alberta from 1937. Now, I want to actually start with a quote from Margaret Lawrence, who um, many of you will have read from one of her novels in high school, um, but she wrote an amazing essay called Where the World Began. And she says, a strange place it was, that place where the world began, a place of incredible happenings, splendors and revelations, despairs like multitudinous pits of isolated hells, a place of shadow spookiness inhabited by the unknown dead a place of jubilation and of mourning, horrible and beautiful. It was, in fact, a small prairie town. When I think about small towns, whether they're a medieval small town or the town I grew up with in rural Alberta, 
What we really need to remember is that we're coming to any kind of historical or archaeological discipline uh, with ideas that come from where we come from as well. Um, and so in thinking about central Anatolia, I have always been heavily influenced by the fact that I grew up in central Alberta. Um, and oh, I just want to go back here for a second. And I want to talk a little bit about how central Alberta changed, right? So the big thick line, I can't get too far away from the, <laughs> from the equipment, but the big thick line moving up um, the middle is the roads that were put into it's a road map. And just off to the side, you can, uh, you can see where the original railroad lines were. Now, in the, um, when the railroads were put in, a lot of these little towns came into being. And center, or central and southern Alberta is full of these tiny little towns that were once really blossoming towns. And I give you one example, which is the town of Vulcan. Um, Vulcan is tiny today. It has a population of about 1900 and it decreases every year. And it was one of these original railway towns. It has 1900 people because it gets by on tourism because it's milked the Star Trek franchise. And it's, it's a charming town if you ever get a chance to go there. But it is an example of one of these towns that as the use of land changed, started to decline. Um, some of these railway towns have almost disappeared entirely. They have two or three residents. So very different kind of things. And then on the other side, you have the town where I actually grew up, which was a planned town that started in 1948 uh, by Imperial Oil that bought it, established it. It's got these nice straight streets. Um, and its population continues to increase. It's on the roads. When I was a kid there, it was about 3,500, 4,000 people. And it's up to, I think, about 7,500 now. Um, it's still a small town, but uh, you can see how towns evolve and change depending on how they're being used. When we think about this stuff in the medieval world, we tend not to think about evolution and change and adaptation. We like to put things in boxes. And one of the things that I really have started to think about um, with Chatterhoek is how we change our perception of these. Now, the other piece of this history, and I will say overtly, this was a piece of history that I was not taught properly when I was a child, was that there is a more complicated story that goes back further than a planned town in 1948 or a planned town in 19, uh, in 1850. And of course, these, these, um, these towns are on lands that originally belonged to different indigenous groups. So in the South, uh, Treaty 7, and you've got an original picture of a Treaty 7 encampment. And then, of course, the Pekani Nation, which is a functioning uh, reserve. And then um, Treaty 6, which is the northern part, um, the Enoch Reserve, and, of course, an old picture. So I, I, what I'm trying to get to here is that there's a whole other complicated story about land use and colonialism that we often leave out of this narrative because we tend to want to put things in boxes. Now, we don't do that so much anymore, and we're starting to get better at it, but there are still things we don't do. So this came out a few years ago. Um, Enoch Cree Nation in Alberta reaches a $91 million settlement with Canada over land. What had happened was during the Second World War, the government of Canada took back two hectares of land on this Indian reserve and used it as a uh, bombing practice camp. And then at the end of the war, walked away, leaving most of the bombs unexploded in the land. The, um, the uh, Cree nation then put a, a golf course on top of it uh, and had to close the golf course when it turned out there were bombs there that nobody had told them about. Uh, and so there's a really good film um, called The Crying Fields on the Enoch um, uh, Reserve website um, that you can watch about this whole thing. Um, but again, here's another story, right? So there are story after story after story that humanize these regions and make them really significant to us. We've lost a lot of these stories um, and we're gaining them back in Canadian society. And I think it's a really important thing. And I've learned a lot from working with Indigenous scholars at the University of Calgary, and I owe them a huge debt of, of gratitude. Um, 
And then when we start to take that kind of thing, and this is not to co-opt indigenous knowledge, but it is to take the kind of thinking that we have uh, started to learn to do and apply it to our own fields to create a better narrative of more complete stories. And so one of the first things we have to do is we have to, and this is a point where people get quite irritated with me about, but we have to grapple with the colonialism and orientalism in uh, Byzantine studies, in medieval studies generally, uh, and what that has done for the loss of identity. And so there are four different categories that have affected how we think about rural Anatolia and how we think about our understanding of these, um, of these areas. So first, when we think of Byzantium, this is what we think of. Really nice art, okay? Art is not archeology. span Believe me, once we get to my site, you're not going to see anything pretty. So enjoy this, right? Um, so, but this has been a form of silencing large uh, swaths of the population, right? And there's nothing wrong with this, but we have to be aware of what we're doing when we privilege the elite and the religious and the urban, and then put the rural in a box that we sometimes see in manuscripts, but then it's all very much sort of quintessential images of uh, the order of, of Sikion, so a nice rural saint, or we have peasants. This does not, neither of these things has anything to do with what I'm finding um, in, uh, in Chatter. And so we have to be really careful about these boxes. This is the third one. And this is a big problem, um, is what happens in Anatolia in the 11th century. It's very easy to rely on narratives of warfare and say, well, of course, the Seljuks came in and with the arrival of the Turks in Anatolia, everything was destroyed, all the Greeks had to leave and it was all very sad and then we don't know what happened. Again, this is not 100% accurate. That's probably not even 50% accurate. It's a very complex situation that we can only look at piece by piece by piece putting things parallel to each other, not even necessarily comparing them so that we understand that this is a Western construct that doesn't actually reflect what was going on on the ground. And then finally, and I always love this photo of good old Von der Austin, um, <clears throat> gazing meaningfully into the distance. Um, the Europeans, of course, arrive in Anatolia to excavate it. Uh, here he is gazing off at Kerkenest, which has a Byzantine fortress on it, and this is the site at Alishar. Both of these sites are within 20 minutes of the site where I work at. Um, when he dug um, Alishar, uh, and when they dug Kerkenest, um, and they, they just did test trenches at Kerkenest, um, there was absolutely um, no care taken really with anything from the Roman to the Ottoman period, none of it. So they excavate it all as one big lump and it is published in uh, his reports. Uh, it gets a tiny little chapter in his reports. I think that entire period gets less space than a rather problematic uh, chapter on skull shape and size. And I'll leave that to your imaginations. Um, so, it was very problematic. And what it was, was a feminizing and orientalizing of um, all of these medieval periods. The Byzantines didn't matter because they were degraded Christians. The Seljuks were not important. The Ottomans, the Ottomans were problematic because they weren't as good as the new Republican Turks who they were working with. They were Europeanized, so that was okay. So there's a whole set of ugly that goes on top of all of this. And we, we have to be aware of it because it affects how we in the present talk about, um, talk about the past and talk about these medieval communities. The other thing to think about is whether landscape and identity are connected and how we think about this. And this is really important for the medieval period. Right. Not to say this isn't important in other periods, but as far as I'm concerned, what we have in the medieval period is actually a really wonderful uh, place to look at how um, environment changes, landscape changes, landscape use changes as we go through very identifiable cyclical uh, climate events 
that are nicely nicely connected, particularly for central um, archaeology, by the um, the samples from Nar Lake. So we've got great scientific data. We know what the periods are, and we have one site, right? And uh, you know, not to play up the importance of my site, but we're we're pretty important. But we need more. We need more of these sites because there is a lot that we can um, we can say about how communities evolve and change. Now, here you have a view of my site, which I promise I'm coming to shortly. Um, but I've also put up a map here from the um, 1981 Tabula Imperii Byzantini, uh, which was the volume on Cappadocia, which also included our area. And what I want to stress here is, um, if you look to where it says Basilica Therma right in the middle, it doesn't, the specifics don't really matter. I'm not gonna talk about every town, but almost every town in that circle, if you circle out from it, has remnants of the medieval past in it. Now it may not be a lot, but it's there. It's um, chunks of liturgical furnishings in one village, like at Yazlatash. It's columns in the graveyard at um, Mehmet Bailey, which is a village that has been around forever, right? So we have evidence for these medieval communities to be working throughout this entire region. They talk to each other, they work together. Um, it's just that nobody's really ever looked at it carefully. And so they've cataloged some of it in the tabula, um, but you know that was 1981, they were doing this by hand, they couldn't get everything. Kerkenes isn't in there. It's got a Byzantine castron in it, right? So there's stuff missing. Um, and we don't really think about sort of the holistic picture of these landscapes. We want a site that we can then put in a box and say it does this. But in fact, what you're looking at is a variety of small communities that were probably working together. And two of my colleagues, uh, Tony Loricella and Lori, uh, Laurel Hackley have um, have done some rough survey in the region and they have come to this conclusion. Now their results aren't published yet, but what they will be able to do is show us exactly how much of this stuff is actually out there. And it matters, right? It isn't enough to just say, well, there's a rock here, a rock there. It, it actually kind of matters. And it matters because it helps show us how the resilience model works as we come in and out of environmental periods. And we can talk about that more at the end if anybody has any questions. So why do we use microhistories? So we have to use the microhistories of sites because we need to look at what we do have and put it side by side in order to try to complete, uh, to keep, create a more complete picture. We're doing that without reference to written sources because there are none. And that is really important. We have more in common with um, prehistoric archaeology than we do with classical archaeology in terms of what the resources are for central Anatolia. So um, using microhistories, I love this quote from Amelie Kurt, Natalie Kurt, because it really shows how pieced together we are. Uh, an analogy would be that of attempting to write the history of Britain using worm-eaten records found in a monastery, a civil service department, a gentleman's private study, and perhaps a section of the British Library, all separated by centuries from one another. If you replace those all with just artifacts, right? And so we're trying to put together a story based on stratigraphy and finds, but in fact, sometimes it's even more complex than that and witness 20 years of pottery that I'm trying to deal with and it's all cooking pots, right? So we have to take what we can and put it together and create something that allows us to understand how these communities functioned on a, on a chronological level, not just, okay, we have this from this period and this from this period. I'm heavily influenced by this article and so I always like to put it up. Um, the, this is from the Icelandic School of Microhistory, and for the archaeologists, they refuse they refer to it as singularizing or singularization of sites. I think it's really important because their big argument is that we have to stop trying to compare stuff. We need to just look at it, establish what we have, and then put them side by side. Because just as Calgary is not like Vancouver, there may be parallel trends, so two villages in the medieval world we're not the same, right? And so we have to stop trying to 
make something fit in every single place when there's just no way that it's going to. So here is my site again um, at Chatterhoek, and some of you will have seen some of these slides before. Uh, I'm on research leave after five years of being department head, so I'm learning again to you know, bring this stuff forward. So uh, please uh, have patience with me. Um, but I want to talk about two kinds of microhistory here and just give you a sense of what we can do with this material when we actually break it down into its basic forms. So we have two areas um, of excavation. We have the Northern Terrace and we have um, the mound itself. And I want to start with the terrace because the uh, period of, of uh, the chronology is much longer there than it is on the uh, mound. And I'll show you why that is in a second. So what we have down there is a house or village complex. I suspect it's a village complex by the 10th and 11th century, but we haven't gotten far enough to really say for sure. Uh, the very messy slide um, of all the rocks, I think, is a really good indicator of what we're dealing with when we're putting together a microhistory of these sites. So what you have there is, uh, in fact, wall on wall on wall on wall on wall. And what you're actually looking at there is the entire stratigraphic um, leveling of the site. The very base where you see sort of red splotches is Imperial Roman. We have carbon-14 dates from there. We know there was some sort of Roman settlement there. I don't know what the nature of it was. We then get into a much nicer uh, probable villa in the fourth, fifth century, and we have coin evidence there. Uh, and that roughly corresponds to the nice straight dark lines. Uh, and there's a lot of little wall stubs that were removed subsequently, probably in the early medieval period, so seventh to ninth century. And then we have another rebuilding in the, um, in the 10th century, or sorry, the 11th century, uh, and then we have nomadic groups that come through and use the site um, and uh, herding groups is probably a better word. Um, and so we see some evidence for this, but not a lot of building. So you can see how complicated the stratigraphy is. We are peeling back wall after wall after wall to try and figure out from what we have what is actually happening uh, at this site. So. The early stuff, the late Roman stuff is nice. We have plastered basins. Here's a before and after picture. We have a lot of very nice organized um, settlement, um, <clears throat> probably based on slave labor and uh, sort of what we would think of as a rural um, provincial villa kind of culture. So don't think about a Roman villa, but think about um, a large house that takes in pieces of what we would think of as traditional Roman villas, but also local um, traditions. Uh, we have evidence in this period, and this is the last time you'll see it, for trade and nice things. Um, we have some imported redwares, um, uh, and we have some luxury items like this little metal box lid. Um, and then by the middle of the seventh century, this is what starts to happen. They attempt to hold on to that. So we get some sort of really ugly imitation wares. Um, this one always looks like somebody who's maybe drunk decorated it. Uh, we get a few pieces of this, then they just give up and they just go to course wear. Um, we get some rebuilding, the walls get a little wonkier. Um, and then after about the ninth, end of the ninth into the 10th century, we get a huge rebuilding. So a lot of money is put into this uh, site again. We get nice straight walls again. Um, we get a nice paved floor. We get uh, limestone floors outside. Uh, and we dug underneath these uh, cobbles. And if you go down low enough, you get to the late Roman, um, you, you get good evidence for red wares and things from the late Roman period again. Um, but up here, the nicest pottery we get is, is the one you see there. There's, there's no imports coming from anywhere. So we're looking at local communities. It doesn't mean they're necessarily poor. It means that importing things from the coast is, is problematic, right? You can't afford to bring in pottery from Thessalonica. Uh, and so you rely on stuff like this. Um, we get a huge amount of metal objects. 
So one of the things that happens in this period is they put in a kitchen. Um, this kitchen area is attached to a stable. And so the nicer parts of the house are on the other side, but we get this sort of um, workmanlike area on this side. Uh, this kitchen area has all of these artifacts in it, um, a number of different horse-related, animal-related artifacts. There's a bone saw, uh, stirrup, that sort of thing. Some of these um, seem to have been um, messed around with or reused probably as herders came in after the site was abandoned. Um, they may have set up shop in some of the areas, and we know this because there's some uh, evidence for things that have parallels in the uh, early Seljuk period, like this little metal jug. Um, I'm still looking for an exact parallel, but I've found a few that, that um, are Seljuk period, and we have a Danish mended coin. So we've got this clear sequence that goes all the way through. Um, and when we're looking at this as a microhistory, when we can carry it through, what we see is that there aren't really major gaps in the sequence, but what you're looking at is the cycle of a community and how it changes as different things come into play. When we go to the mound itself, um, what we get on the mound itself is a different kind of microhistory. Um, and so, uh, let me just give you a view of this. Now, before I start talking about that, I want you to really sort of take in the landscape and think about how this land would have been utilized, right? We, again, we tend to take sites out of their landscape. Uh, and this was really brought home to me um, in 2019, just before the pandemic, um, because I was asked to go out to Eastern Turkey where I looked at a bunch of churches, Syriac churches, um, they were assessing them to see whether they were in danger of falling over. And I have looked at those Syriac churches since I was a graduate student. I had no idea that the majority of them are sitting in villages from the 10th, 11th, 12th century that have never been looked at, never recorded, never excavated. They're just sitting there, right? We take this stuff out of context all the time because we're interested in church architecture or we're interested in this kind of architecture we're interested in the art but when you contextualize it the microhistory of continuity makes more sense so again we have continuity we have one roman or late roman structure uh i don't know what they're doing up here if anybody has any ideas i'll take them um it's one room there's nothing else inside it was sort of hanging off the mound. They spent a lot of time, effort, and money on it. Uh, it was all plastered. It had beautiful bricks. It was painted. It may have been some sort of religious structure. Um, everybody used it after that for other things, but it was Roman in its origins. Um, we know this from the painted plaster and from the bricks, which are not stamped. So it's probably sort of second, third century. Uh, this is the other side of it, and we, we made uh, Portoni dig all the way down here. He's still with the team. God knows why after we made him do this. There's nothing in here. It's completely dead. The soil is completely dead except for fragments of the wall that had fallen off. So we know that the Romans did not use the rest of the mound. We've never found anything else except in that area. Um, in the late Roman period, they continued to use that room and they put in a little walkway up. Uh, and we know it's late Roman because one of the rocks has a cross engraved on it. Um, again, they don't seem to be spending a lot of time up there. They're using this for some purpose um, that we really don't understand. So this is, this is an area where we're still trying to sort out what's going on. They then, do nothing up there, as far as we can tell. From about, except for putting in that, that wall with a little gate, from about the fifth century right through to about 950, nothing seems to happen up there. And the reason for this is largely that they don't seem to have needed any kind of fortification or any kind of place to hide or do things. They're down in the village, they're perfectly fine. There's no evidence for an attack in this village or anything. Um, and so nothing really goes on up there. In about 950, though, things start to get rocky out in this area of Anatolia. And we start to see this community worrying a bit more. 
Uh, and so the fortifications, um, they start to fortify the whole site. And so you can see the wall, it circles around it, it incorporates that funny little Roman room. Um, this is only the second time I've been able to say with absolute certainty about these dates. So I'm very excited um, because we finally got some C14 dates. So this is, we have uh, almost no properly dated fortifications. Um, and so this also puts to rest, I think, an old theory that all of these fortified sites, and there are hundreds of them, were sad peasants huddled at the top of mounds in the seventh century. So it's nothing to do with the seventh century. The foundations are definitely dated early, so er, later. So it's a it's an important um, it's important in terms of understanding this, and it parallels then that nice rebuild on the terrace. And so um, we get these fortifications, uh, lots of little fortified rooms. They're not living up there. They're not hiding up there. They are largely storing things up there. It's a large storage room. And it has a later addition, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have a little forge up there. So they're making all of the nails. I'm desperately trying to find a student to study. Um, they have, there's drainage up there, um, lots of drainage actually. Uh, and lots of ovens and hearths and grinding stones. So they're putting stuff up there, they're processing stuff up there. It's, it's, it's an area for processing it. And it's a good place to keep it safe, right? You've put in this wall, so there's some concern, but not enough concern for this population to be huddling up there. That's not what they're doing. They're using this as a place to store stuff safely. Um, by the early 11th century though, we start to see changes. And they are starting to panic a little bit more. So we see those nice straight walls, they start adding on other little rooms and they don't worry so much about whether the walls line up anymore. Um, so we get a lot more guard rooms up there. Um, on the very south side, you can see one of these additions. Uh, we also get a um, seal that dates to about 1045. Um, who's uh, an official in this area. His name is Petros Persebergues. Um, it wasn't the greatest archaeological context, but was good enough that we're pretty comfortable that it's the right, um, the right dating period. Uh, so they have connections. People are telling them to be worried about something. Um, and we now start to see by the mid-11th century, they're starting to build houses and things up here. Um, not a lot, but a few little mud brick enclaves. Um, and they seem to put up what we think, and please argue with me, I won't be upset about it, we think is a little chapel. Um, we have a Byzantine site, medieval site with no church. So I don't know where the church is. Um, it's pretty funny since I wrote my dissertation on the development of the altar, and I have the only Byzantinist who doesn't have one. But anyway, maybe this, this may be wishful thinking is what I'm getting at but it's a little mud brick enclave. It had what looked like an altar that had been pushed over. So we think it's like a little chapel um, that they put up in this period at the same time as they put up this little house. Um, by about uh, 1050, trouble does arrive. And so here's what that little house looked like originally. Those are the foundations of it. This is what actually uh, we excavated. So there's a destruction level, there was burning, something very bad happened at the site. Um, this is an old, an old story from this site, but it still uh, always shocks people. Um, the people seem to have run away. They left a few guards, uh, they left a couple of shepherds, and they disappeared. They left their animals all tied up, the animals died where they stood. And so we have a whole stable that was attached to that storage building that was full of animals, including pigs. So that tells us which community we're dealing with. Um, in the storage building, we have another seal, which is about the mid 11th century, was somebody who was out in this region at that time. Uh, he married a local, um, the daughter of a local elite family. His name was Samuel Lucianos. Um, he was actually tasked with dealing with a group of people who were a real problem in this area at the time, uh, which were the Franks. Uh, and that's going to become important in a second. So we have evidence for military activity, um, a little bit of chain mail, some um, uh, armor, some swords. 
um, horse related stuff. And then this cross, and we actually have two of them. And they're a really big problem because those are not Byzantine crosses. They're St. Peter's crosses, you wear them upside down. They're probably associated with these Frankish mercenaries who had been uh, hired by the Byzantine state because the army was in a fair amount of trouble and then they got bored. And so they just started harassing people all over Anatolia. So in fact, we are pretty sure that what's happened at this site has nothing to do with the Seljuk invasions, uh, but is rather the evidence for a very small minor piece of history of these little local areas being harassed by Frankish mercenaries. Um, it's a stretch based on a couple of artifacts, but what I will say is none of the dates match up with the Turks. And it's important because that's always been the narrative. These communities fell to the Seljuk Turks except there's no evidence for that. And the, the killing up here of the very few people was particularly brutal. And the fact that the animals were left by groups of people who would have been herders seems unlikely, right? Even if you left the cows behind because they were sickly or dairy cows and you didn't take the pigs, why would you leave the sheep and the goats, right? It doesn't make sense. Unless you just ate some sheep and goat, and kept on going, right? And so our best guess is that these are actually these are actually actions of Frankish mercenaries. Now that doesn't mean the Seljuks don't arrive. The site is abandoned between about 1050 and 1060. And sometime in the next little while, we get the arrival of Seljuks in the area. Um, these are probably small groups of herders um, who come through here. They reuse parts of the east side of the mound, mostly for animal pens. Um, they do nothing with the majority of the mound, uh, something we're pretty sure of because um, the, uh, the animals, were, there was no cleaning up of those ad, that area with all the animal bones and those would have been pretty visible, um, mostly because there's so many animals moving stuff around. So they're just using one side of the mound. They seem to have um, set up camps up here. Uh, this is a Celtic period artifact. We're not really sure what it is, um, but that little lion face, it's, I think I can say universally for all of us, it's all, we, we all love it. Um, but it has parallels with metal work, uh, workmanship from um, the area of Mosul. So comes, this is stratigraphically and culturally coming from a group of people who are coming through here. They set up windbreaks. Um, the other thing they do is in the areas they use, they clean up a lot of stuff, put it in a basket and throw it over the side into this Roman room. And in here, we find a lot of broken Christian artifacts, uh, pro, uh, uh, processional crosses, um, what looks like a little incense sensor, uh, processional cross, and another of these St. Peter's crosses, right? Um, they toss this all over the side. Nothing ever happens to it until we appear and excavate it. Um, whether they meant to melt it down and just never went back for it, or whether they were just getting rid of Christian artifacts, it's hard to say. They don't seem to have stayed there long periods of time. It seems to have been largely seasonal. Um, we get some disturbance of stuff down on the terrace. We get what's going on up on the mound. And then occasionally we get other things. And I'll, I'll finish um, here with a couple of sort of final comments. Um, this is the only proper burial we have at the mound, at the site. Um, she's buried at the base of the mound. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> when they dug this grave, they really uh, made a mess of some of the Bronze Age archeology. span And I'm still hearing about that, like, like it's my fault. Um, but <laughs> she is not Bronze Age. She is definitely medieval. Um, she's got a late uh, medieval pot there. Um, it's unclear whether those are uh, reused pots, or if this is their remaking in the style. Uh, she was about 45 years old. Um, but she's pointing uh, very importantly towards Mecca. And she has a rock, that rock on her neck is deliberate. So we're looking at people who are coming through here who are probably Muslim, but still hold on to some animistic traditions from Central Anatolia, so very early Seljuks. Like we're not, we're talking about very, very early groups. 
Um, but they gave her a proper burial, whoever she was, and they were obviously afraid of her, right? So there's a weird combination of things here, but it sort of speaks to an end of this site. And so this, this micro history that we pull through on this site gives us a real sense of how these communities waxed and waned. Is this the same as every other community? No. Can it be put alongside what happens at Kerkenes and what happens at Alishar and what happens at Mehmet Bailey and at Kone and at Tavium? Yes. And should we? Yes, because then we can start to put together a larger narrative. The stories continue down even to the modern day. So that view of the landscape um, is taken from a hill which has a tiny little mosque on the top of it. And the burials associated with the mosque are all uh, women and children. Um, they're from quite a while ago. But when we asked uh, people in the village, you know, what, what was up here, we got alternate stories. The first story was that it was Bill Clinton's summer house. I don't know, it was a long time ago. Uh, and then... <laughs> Uh, and then we got a story, a folkloric story about Seljuk martyrs, which actually has a parallel in Christian martyrdom stories from Sebastia. So you can see how things shifted through time. Um, and so we can put together sort of a story of a landscape that is used by these populations. And I think in a lot of ways, it creates more of a sense of community um, and really humanizes them and really makes us think um, about them. Um, and so with that, I, I'm going to go back to Indigenous Canadian history for a minute. And I just I want to draw attention to the person who's really helped me think about a lot of this, who is my colleague, Craig Ginn at the University of Calgary, uh, who is a religious studies scholar uh, of Indigenous um, subjects. Uh, he is also a, um, we call him a rock star. Uh, he did, um, he's onto his second album now um, called The Songs of Justice Project. Um, where he has thought a lot about historical subjects and put them into song and talked a lot about these communities and our assumptions about them. Uh, and so um, I put his website up there, but also specifically the song Hercules, which is uh, not about Hercules, but rather about a plane um, that went into northern Manitoba um, and was the precursor to destroying the way of life for an entire uh, Dene community who were moved out of the region. And so we have an abandoned town there with, again, a story that we might lose unless we're willing to take a microhistorical approach and look at these things. And so I, I really owe a huge debt of thanks to, um, to Craig Ginn and uh, to Michael Hart and to people who I've worked with who have really helped me think about landscape in different ways. Um, because, you know, as a Canadian from the prairies, I think I have a different view of landscape than somebody who's, you know, an urban scholar from Paris or London, because I understand that landscape in a different way. And I think we all have to take that into account uh, and really think about how these micro histories can improve our understanding of medieval communities. Thank you. So, as I promised, I'm not going to be intervening very much. I'm basically going to turn it to uh, our audience and uh, uh, ask if there is any questions with which to, to start this uh, conversation. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for this. Uh, I'm getting into micro history myself, so I think this is a, this was super super useful. Good. Oh, good. Selfishly good. speaking, but also, yeah, I have two questions. Yeah. One is you mentioned at one point that they. Uh, I think for the kind of when the urban settlement starts to grow a yeah. bit more, uh, that they can't afford pottery from the Saloniki, so they make their own. Yeah. Do we see them trying to copy styles that are outside from the region in terms of our, how are, how much can we tell them being aware of the wider Good question. World? We don't actually have any evidence for them being aware of things like graffito wear or anything like that. And I want to be clear, it's not really about the finances so much as like, I cannot imagine in this period how hard it would be. There's no trade networks. You, you just can't bring that all the way from Thessalonica the way you could redwares, for example, in the Roman period when the roads were good. And um, what they do do is uh, it's still courseware. So we have no fineware. I have five tiny, like thumbnail size pieces of fineware 
that uh, parallel stuff coming from Syria. And um, that's it. 20 years. That's what I have. It's ridiculous. Um, and I have one piece of whiteware. And when Yoannid Vroom gave it to me, I was like, oh my God, we have whiteware. We have one piece of white. Um, but what they actually do is they have a sort of micaceous slip that they put on their pots that makes them metallic. There's a metallic sheen to them. And it's like they are imitating metal pots. Right. So that's what I think they're doing. Um, so they make their own nice pottery, um, which is, but it's still of course where the fabric's really rough. There's nothing, but that's what they're doing is this, this slip that, that just makes it glimmer a little bit. Um, and when you find a really nicely made piece, it's pretty awesome. Um, where they're doing this, I don't know. We haven't found any evidence for pottery production, but that doesn't mean it isn't down on the terrace where we haven't excavated. Um, there's continuous occupation at Kerkenes, which did have a known pottery production center in the fifth century and sixth century. So it's possible that's reused. Um, and I think the only excavation in there was done in the thirties by Schmidt and von der Osten. So um, God knows what happened to that pottery. It'd be hard to tell. Uh, but I have I have actually started to go back through old reports and old documentation from von der Osten, trying to see if anybody recorded anything that would help with that. Because I that may be where they're coming from, but I don't know. Yeah. I had a, I, oh. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can talk all day. <laughs> so the follow is kind of related to it. Do we and I know it's hard for, again, we don't have textual evidence to see how they engage with stuff, but do we have any examples where we see them? And you mentioned, for example, the pottery place where they produce it, they yeah. might have been still used later on, where they engaged with the past forms, not just to reuse the materials, but rather to keep them and to not fetishize them, but to make them into a site of their own, right? And uh, yeah. they were still available throughout centuries. You can see that it's, it's always on the kind of ground level or something. Right? Of course, or, the, this is the problem. Courseware is like this, right? A frying pan is a frying pan is a frying pan. Um, so what you know, usually we use the pots to help with the stratigraphy. Here, we're actually having to use the stratigraphy to help with the pots. It's a strange problem. Um, the only people who've done this successfully so far in Anatolia are at Sagalassos. Um, Komana is doing some of this, but uh, Bridges step is a little bit later. And we're starting to now, after all these years, for a variety of stops and starts, I was never a pottery person, but apparently I am now. So I am, I'm trying to, um, we're trying to get this out because it needs to be out so that people can see if we're right. You know, I mean, we, we need to see if the chronology is right. There are minor variations, but because a lot of it is courseware, the forms don't change a lot. And that's one of the problems. A lot of cooking pots, a lot of cooking pots. <laughs> So um, I really like the fact that you put this uh, larger yeah. picture in the, with the truck uh, somewhere at the very bottom of the of the mound um, because it really gives you a sense of, uh, of wider landscapes and uh, it it helps you think of this uh, element of interconnectedness that mm -hmm. you that you have in mind yeah. and I think that that image in the landscape makes it possible to imagine. A wider regional culture, totally, which itself changes as you move kilometer yeah. by kilometer on the yeah. landscape, and as other things come into view, and as yeah, uh, yeah, I, I'm a text person. Recently, I came to with metastasis into yeah. view cone, view cones, and I'm thinking, how are these people imagining yeah. their neighbors? And the connection with the neighbors, uh, which is not just I traveled there for two hours because I needed to sell something, but because right. I can see them. Yeah. Okay. Um, the sight line issues here are a little bit hard. We have started to work on this. There are a couple of other mounds you can see from here, but keep in mind that this is not necessarily um, uh, this is not necessarily a major military installation or anything. Um, the soldiers who are up there are probably local guys who are co-opted by a local landowner, and that you know, and they're, and they're Byzantine military for sure. But they're this is you know, th there's not an entire settlement of soldiers or anything. So the like in terms of um, the sight lines here, 
when you're at the top of the mountain, you can see the whole valley. Um, and it's one of the reasons we think the Romans just put up a little post or something there. Um, but you're, so you can see the whole valley. You can see if anybody is coming towards you. Um, what I think is more important is that these hills are like satellites to a much larger settlement. So here um, on the other side um, of the major road is the site of Yushaklahoyak, which is uh, a Hittite, primarily a Hittite site. It looks almost the same as us. Um, and the Italian team that digs there um, very proudly tell me that they're not going anywhere near the top because they don't want to <laughs> deal with the medieval stuff because they, they don't have people to deal with it yet. Um, but uh, there's lots of these little hills and the major site in the region, which has never been properly explored from a medieval period perspective, is Kerkinus. And Kerkinus is very famous in Iron Age archaeology as this site right where they, it, it was in use for a hundred years, it was a massive city and then just fell out of use. And it's been alternately connected with different cities in Herodotus. But what is often neglected is that there is a major Byzantine castle there, Castron, big. Um, and then there's little settlements all the way around it. So it was a major center of some type in the Byzantine period. It was probably a local landowner but nobody's really explored this. Um, so I'm hoping in the next few years, the, the excavator Scott Branting and I have been talking about trying to figure out what's going on. Um, but I think Kerkinus and then all of these sites around it, I, I think that's the negotiation. And yeah, that's because none of these sites are particularly significant, but they're is a site that is significant, but nobody's really explored it from that perspective, right? They're digging, you know, they're digging all the Iron Age stuff and it's lovely, but um, the Byzantine stuff is largely gone on notice. So I think from a landscape point of view, um, on a clear day, you can see the Kirkinus Mound from us um, and it takes 15 minutes by car to get to it. So it would have been the logical, and then I think all these little mounds were connected to it in some way. And, and it's in, this, in between those mounds is, Cultivable or grazable lands, and people have boundaries and imagine exactly this, yeah. Uh, yeah. this space is divided between them, yeah. and perhaps subservient for administrative purposes to Kerkinos. Um, yeah, and like even so, if you go straight back from the mound, that's our village, Painir Yemez, and then uh, all, you can look over to the side, and there's another little village called Yaslatash. Uh, both villages have remnants of Byzantine stuff in them. Um, and in the fields between them, there's some major structure sitting in a farmer's field. Um, and they all tell us it's some sort of Roman thing. I don't know, it's in somebody's field. Um, so there's, there's structures in the fields. Um, and when you're looking south from the mound, uh, there are structures in the fields down there as well. So like, there's much more, much more complexity than we understand for this period. Which of course raises questions of resilience when. So I had an experience in 2012, 13 uh, at Oxford at the talk, and uh, Mark Little kind of flippantly uh, said to me, "But uh, you know, you're talking about this Roman identity in Victoria. It doesn't seem to be strong. The moment the Celtics come, it all seems to crumble." And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. "What do you mean it crumbles? I mean, back then I hadn't even sorted it out, but." Yeah. How do you make all these places disappear? <laughs> you don't. You don't. That, that's it. Some of them do disappear. They stop being used. Yeah. We're a good example. But um, there's Seljuk, minor Seljuk stuff at Kerkinus. But what, what I think the, different, dif the difference is that when the Seljuks arrive in the area, um, I mean, Andrew Peacock uh, is the, uh, yeah, uh, no, sorry, Scott Red, well, both of them, Andrew Peacock and Scott Redford both write about this, but Scott Redford in particular has talked about the fact that we don't understand as much as we think we do about intermarriage and, um, you know, communities that came together, whether violently or otherwise. Um, and so when we think about the Seljuks too, right, we're often thinking about urban Seljuks, the elite Seljuks in places like Sivas or Kanya 
where they are very Muslim, putting up beautiful structures. But the majority of Seljuks who came along with the elite were, nomadic is not the right word, um, but they were hurting and they were doing things in seasonal. So they're coming through these villages, but they're not necessarily going to settle. So we have to change our perception about what makes a community as well, right? Does it have to be a settled community to still be in use, right? And so I would say Chatter's a good example where they come and use the stuff, they just don't stay all year and it's seasonal. But I think there's something to be said by the fact for the fact that these villages stay in use right through the Ottoman period. They undergo name changes, they, you know, but you can look at maps from the late 1700s and some of these villages with different names are on the maps. So the landscape is, is what pulls people in and makes them continue to use the space. Um, and so like the idea of putting things in boxes and saying, this is an urban site, this is a rural site, this is, a, I mean, we, we have to look at the larger context, I think. What specifically happens? I mean, this is slightly after Saif al Dawla uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and those campaigns. Yeah. Um, it's nothing specific to 950. I mean, we're looking here at C14 day. So, okay. you know, give or, give or take. Um, I think at that point, once you get out of the Macedonian emperors in this particular area, um, and We've just written an article where I've got a little bit about this, but I think there's a there's a conceptual change about land ownership that happens around 950. Um, as we start to get, you know, to the end of the Macedonian emperors, we get more local landowners, and what they do is pretty awful um, in terms of taking land from um, uh, from what had been. Uh, you know, I don't say peasant society, but farmer society, they co-opt these lands. Um, they do some pretty horrible things, right? They buy up whole villages and then toss everybody out. Um, and I think this is probably par for the course. And in this area, we get a lot of these elites who um, are big ranchers, this is big um, beef and dairy cow territory. And so they're, they're taking a lot of these landscapes um, and we get these sort of local elites who take these landscapes and build them up. Um, kind of an intestamental kind of process. Sort of, of yeah. Of and, it, and it pushes, and it, it pushes uh, that population that had a little more freedom between the 7th and the 9th, early 10th century. It starts to push them back into a more servitude. Um, we're not at the point where they're you know, being thrown off their land completely yet. But that is the logical consequence of what happens, right? And it's really, I mean, Basil, who's the last to sort of try to stop this. And if you look at some of the legal, like they tried very hard to protect the local small scale landowners and ultimately it failed because the elites in these areas kind of ran them like little fiefdoms and just took the land they wanted. So, but they would do things like, you know, buy a chunk of land, um, and then put up a brand new house and then take the land from other people. It was, it was, it was, it was about land ownership. And in a way, it's kind of a return to the uh, kind of uh, Cappadocian style culture that yeah. Dan describes in late antiquity with yeah. the, uh, yeah. after the yeah. small scale. Uh, yeah, landowners. absolutely. Yeah. Less slaves, more farmers. That. Do we have any, any, I don't know if we can have any idea, uh, but of how much the landscape is changing in terms of, do we see any land clearance happening of the wooded areas or something, or how valuable is the land at the time for the competition of the bigger land lords trying to get in or out? I, I, it's very... It, it's mostly about ranching land right. and being able to herd. Um, so Kerkenes, for example, this is one of the things that I think needs better consideration at Kerkenes. It's a walled area that would be perfect ranching land. Right, you just send your cows out to, and and um, so I I think that's that's what it's about is because uh, there are some basic crops in the area, but um, mostly 
what we understand from uh, mostly Celis, Michael Celis, is the, this land becomes largely uh, ranching land, yeah, for grazing animals. Yeah. yeah. So they're not clearing much. So they, it's, yeah. There's a little bit amount of land already in circulation. Yeah. We'll be trying to pour, right? The trees. There were not a lot more trees. Trees yeah. are always a problem, which is why you have to build in stone and mud here. So, um, and I just had a thought. Nope, it's gone. He'll come back to me. But, um, yeah, it, it was. Uh, it was really about that sort of taking the land and yeah i had a question about so you mentioned earlier how these towns like have to be taken individually sort of to see their uh, mm -hmm. their history too so within this specific area do you see certain influences let's say the frankish influence or the Seljuk uh, influ uh, influence appearing earlier or later within very close geographic uh, areas or appearing in one settlement and not appearing in mm -hmm. another settlement? We, we do, um, mostly in the urban, in the urban areas. So, um, so in terms of the Frankish stuff, um, the kind of Franks we're talking about here are not the ones who show up later in the Crusades or, you know, not that much later in the group, but not, yeah, we're, we're talking here about, you know, roving bands of, of idiots who <laughs> wander the, the neighborhood, making everybody's life miserable. Um, so there isn't a lot of influence. Now, I say that, but at Amorium, um, we do have evidence for there being Franks there for longer periods of time because we have more things like Frankish belt buckles and things like that. Um, so that would be the kind of influence we see until the Crusades. And then uh, in Eastern Turkey, for sure, um, we get like Crusader style fortifications and things like that because they make uh, agreements with um, people in Odessa and things like that. But out here, it would be just sort of hit and miss what we find. Now, in terms of the Seljuks, again, in some places, even by you know, even by the early 12th century, we do start to get more Seljuk influence. So the site of the, what was the late antique site of Sebastia um, is about three hours by car from here. It's now modern Turkish Sebas. Um, Sebastia is known through all of the sources as you know, there were martyrs from Sebastia. It was a, it was a bishopric and all of this. There, if you go to Sebas today, there's almost nothing left from anything before the Seljuks because they took apart everything that was Roman and built it into their own structures. So absolutely beautiful um, uh, um, uh, Seljuk architecture. It's one of the it's one of the high points for Syria for Seljuk architecture. Um, but they they completely reconstructed everything to make it. So we do see as early as the 12th century, um, the influence of Seljuk architecture um, and Seljuk imagery. And, and again, in a site like this, you're not going to get that kind of major thing, but if you go to uh, even a little bit south to Mosul to Northern Mesopotamia, there's a huge, uh, huge amount of code Co, um, codependence is not the word, uh, connection um, between Christian and Muslim communities in terms of metal work. And a lot of it is coming out of the Seljuk um, and, you know, the, the um, Seljuk traditions. Um, and then it's being, like they're creating something new that then goes to all the communities. So um, the little lion that we have, there are two lions for Daniel and the lion's den on a church in, um, I think in Mosul, maybe Tikrit, I'd have to check, they have exactly the same face. They're stone lions. So it's, you know, the art form does start to shift, but we see it more clearly in Eastern Turkey. Um, but partly too, that's because there's living communities there that have preserved the stuff. Whereas, you know, in Central Anatolia, a lot of the stuff has just disappeared into the soil. So it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything online or uh, okay. So, well, if that is the case, uh, I want to thank you for uh, a wonderful talk and for uh, actually providing a bit of a clinic on uh, how we use uh, uh, our present realities uh, and our present Canadian realities even uh, 
uh, in, uh, in thinking about our, uh, our medieval uh, uh, world. Um, and uh, also thank the audience uh, well, who was here, obviously, and uh, anyone uh, like who's been uh, online for, uh, for being with us. Uh, before we leave, I'd like to uh, uh, let everyone know that our next presentation will take place on Friday, March uh, the 8th at uh, 2.30. Uh, uh, and uh, we will be hosting uh, uh, Brian Lavelle, Professor Emeritus at Loyola University of Chicago. Uh, also, uh, Thursday, March 21st, uh, we'll have the 8th annual uh, McQueenie Memorial Lecture featuring uh, uh, Michalis Sotiropoulos, uh, uh, speaking on liberalism and the foundations of the modern Greek uh, uh, state. To learn more about speakers for this seminar and this year's McQueen lecture, you can go to our uh, newly uh, revamped uh, uh, website, uh, www.sfu.ca slash Hellenic studies slash uh, newsroom for more details. Uh, thank you again for attending and uh, we'll be seeing you next week.